I will want to welcome Mark Collier for the, from the Open Infra Foundation. Thank you. Yes. All right. Okay. I think you have ah. yes. <laughs> I've been pre-miked. Um, great. Well, thank you. And uh, yes. Supposed to stand at that oh no, that's a hard, if hard you, ask. If you move, they will tell you. I get an electric shock if I move. Okay. I like to move a lot, so I'm just going to be kind of swaying here. But um, it's great to be here. Um, you know, on the way here, we were flying in yesterday, and I couldn't help but notice that Taylor Swift is actually coming to Sweden in a couple of weeks. And uh, so, for the record, this is my first time to Sweden, but I did beat Taylor Swift. So, had to get, get in front of that train. Um, but it did get me thinking she's doing her eras tour about all the eras of her music and all of her uh, fashion that she's going through in all these shows and thinking about infrastructure. We've been working on infrastructure software at the Open Infrastructure Foundation for many years. And that kind of fits with the theme that I'm gonna be talking about today was kind of where have we gone and where are we going next in terms of infrastructure? And a lot of that it starts with kind of the demands of physical infrastructure for new use cases and applications. But every time there's a new era of infrastructure, it creates an opportunity for open infrastructure because new software has to get written to power and manage all that infrastructure as it grows for new demands, new performance requirements, et cetera. And our job as a nonprofit foundation is to help our communities write that software and to make sure it's written in the open so that everyone can participate. And so uh, let's see here. That was my intro slide. I think I covered that. So again, I'm Mark Collier, COO at the Open Infra Foundation. And that's really our mission, again, is to build these communities that write software that runs in production for, for infrastructure. Now, since we haven't been here in a while, I haven't had one of these events in a while, quite a few things have changed in the landscape. And one of the things we've observed recently is that there's a huge resurgence of demand for open infrastructure software, specifically OpenStack, but also Kata Containers and Starling X and Zool. These are all projects that our foundation helps to create with our communities. And there's really three key drivers, reasons why you know, OpenStack's now been around for 14 years that we're seeing kind of this new groundswell of interest in it. And so I want to talk about those three examples, three reasons why based on kind of how the landscape has shifted through, throughout the eras. So one of the big drivers is around digital sovereignty, especially uh, throughout Europe. Um, I think that as cloud has continued to grow and become a bigger part of everybody's infrastructure, the need to have infrastructure in country and that's secure and private and give the uh, enterprises a lot more control has sent people back to reconsidering how do they want to architect their clouds, where do they want the clouds to live, what data centers do you want to run them in, and that naturally has led people back to OpenStack, and so we've seen a ton of demand from users that want to build new clouds specifically to meet their requirements, you know, and that includes sustainability, digital sovereignty, and, you know, we'll talk a little bit about AI later, but uh, this is one big driver that we consistently see over and over again the last few years. Um, another big driver of recent demand from, uh, for OpenStack is from some changes from VMware. So they, if you haven't heard, maybe some of you have gotten a, a new bill from VMware lately and it's quite a bit higher, up to 10 times higher. After being bought by Broadcom, there's been a lot of changes and most of the customers and partners in the ecosystem are not super happy about it. And, uh, the way that I think about this really is, is a couple of things. One is something I've learned from working in open source for a long time, which is that trust is huge. Trust is very hard to develop, especially between companies in, in, a, in a you know competitive environment where people are all trying to meet their own business goals. Certainly hard to create a sense of trust in an open source community and even just amongst the customer base. It's very hard to build up, but it's very easy to kind of throw that away in a hurry. So I think what we've seen is a lot of trust has been kind of broken there for a lot of customers. And many of those people are actively looking at OpenStack again. Perhaps during that virtualization era, they went down the proprietary path and maybe having some regrets now and thinking, well, is, let me revisit that decision. 
And the good news is that as a foundation, we have a very strong ecosystem of companies that are already mobilizing and their phones, everyone I talk to, the phone's been ringing off the hook from customers that are saying, well, what could we do to maybe get off of VMware and, and look at OpenStack again? And we recently did a survey of these members of our foundation and we found that uh, you know, over 60% of these member companies had already migrated a customer from VMware to OpenStack. So some of this is, is going on today, but much more I think you'll be hearing about over the next six months as a foundation. We're organizing an effort to kind of you know, put a campaign around this and put a spotlight on all the companies that are uh, exploring this space. We're looking at setting up something like a, a work group to look at places where there may be gaps, um, OpenStack, is not, just to be clear, you know, a drop-in replacement for everything VMware does. It's, it's a different, different animal. It has different uh, strengths, uh, but um, it's a big opportunity, and that, that's the second of the three drivers of, of this resurgence in OpenStack demand. The third is really as we think about the next infrastructure era, um, and that's AI. And I'm sure, like many of you, may be a little bit AI hype fatigue I know these days everybody just throws AI on everything. Um, I was actually at, at KubeCon in Paris a few weeks ago and a lot of the kind of grumbling in the hallways was why is every single keynote about AI, like just talk to me about Kubernetes, that's what I'm here for. And so I get that, I think that's, that's fair. We don't all wanna just talk about AI all day long, but I think when it comes to infrastructure and what we do at the Open Infrastructure Foundation, it's very, very relevant because it's, really uh, physical infrastructure that's being built out that needs software, that needs to evolve. And I'll talk in a few minutes about like specific examples of how the software has and is evolving for this use case. And uh, if you noticed in the title earlier, I mentioned a trillion dollar opportunity, and this really uh, comes from some data that Jensen, the CEO of NVIDIA, recently shared. And what, what he said, and I think he's in a position to know, is that currently there's about a trillion dollars worth of data center infrastructure that's already enabled for accelerated compute. So basically lots of GPUs uh, making, uh, making Jensen very happy and rich. Uh, so I'm sure we're all trying to buy more GPUs than we can find these days if you're trying to serve these users. But that's kind of what's already built. And what he's forecasting is in the next four years, another trillion dollars of infrastructure will need to be built specifically to meet the demands of accelerated compute uh, for AI. And you know, accelerated compute is sort of one aspect of what makes infrastructure work for AI, but it it's hits home for a lot of the pieces that our community produces, like Nova, which is the compute engine and OpenStack, et cetera. But what's kind of mind-blowing to me is the, the amount of capital that's going into this and not just to build things we've built before, but actually push the limit. And uh, in order to meet these requirements, we're actually going to need to have energy breakthroughs, or at the very least, policy breakthroughs in terms of deciding to build massive power plants, specifically nuclear. And this is, you know, everyone has a different opinion about what's a good clean power source these days. But I think it's clear we're going to see more nuclear power plants built specifically for these AI infrastructure era kind of data centers. And a couple of the crazy stats here, well, for one, Amazon actually just bought a new data center that's co-located with a nuclear power plant. And, and I, I mentioned this just, just to kind of understand the scope and scale of this transition. This isn't like the last infrastructure era where, yeah, we built some new data centers and mostly built them near you know, hydro, hydraulic uh, centers or places where electricity was less expensive. But I think we are all more sensitive these days to, you know, clean power and power production. So the fact that uh, the GPUs in total are gonna already taking up more power than many countries in, on the planet, it's a bit alarming, but it's also something we have to be aware of and plan for. And when you think about kind of what that means for, again, open infrastructure software, the piece that we're all working on. You know, one of the concrete examples of that is AI is all about data, and we see today that 80% of all new data being created is unstructured data. That, that plays really well with things like object storage, where Swift is, is uh, very 
uh, popular. We had a keynote from NVIDIA at one of our recent events talking about how they're ingesting a petabyte a day into their AI training system all on their Swift cluster, which is the OpenStack object storage. So when it comes to you know, AI and kind of the, the, the glossy hype, you know, we, we're, we're down in the, uh, the plumbing of infrastructure and it really makes a difference. We actually have to write more new software. It, 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 we have to store more data and we're talking about 180 zettabytes just you know, a year from now. And so when we think about you know, what AI requires, of course we know there's gonna be new hardware and that sort of goes with any new era in infrastructure. There's new hardware, um, whether it's CPUs, GPUs, or storage equipment, and that's going to require new software to be written. And that's going to happen kind of with or without us as an open source community. The, the question is how much of it will be open source? How much of it is gonna actually be open infrastructure? Because every new era in infrastructure where we do a massive upgrade and bring in new or architectures is an opportunity for it to be open, but it's by no means guaranteed. And if you look back at that last era, you know, a lot of people went down the VMware path, some of them went down the open source path, and you know, in a few years, after that four years, five years, we've built that next trillion dollars. Are we gonna wake up to another price increase or to have you know, kind of lack of options or are we gonna be in a better place where we have more options? And uh, something I saw over here I really liked was this quote on the wall, freedom to move in a personal, sustainable, and safe way. I think that's a Volvo uh, original, but uh, it seems to, to fit uh, the philosophy of what we're trying to promote and make happen when it comes to cloud computing and infrastructure is giving people the freedom to move and not being locked in where you might get a 10x uh, increase in your bill one day down the road. So, you know, thinking about it now because this, this transition is gonna happen pretty quickly um, over a short period of time. And so, as a foundation, um, identifying new use cases for infrastructure, mobilizing the ecosystem of companies with software developers, building that consensus and targeting it to the use case is exactly what we do, it's why we exist. And so we're excited to have you know, yet another way to, uh, to approach a new market. And this one's a trillion dollars and there's a lot of arrows here. So I'm just gonna keep clicking until we, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, when it comes to these, these eras where there's new upgrade, new demands on infrastructure, if we kind of go back in time about 10 years, 2014, this is when we were kicking off the 5G era. So from the mobile uh, telecom industry was starting to discover OpenStack, discover open source, and they were asking themselves, okay, where do we want to go in 10 years? Do we want it to be proprietary? Do we want it to be open source? And Toby Ford, who uh, was one of the senior executives at AT&T at the time, one of the biggest telecoms in the world, stood up at our summit and said, look, we need to collectively invest a trillion dollars in this 5G transition. If we do it together, we're gonna get there faster, it's gonna be more efficient, it's gonna be more cost effective, and we're just gonna make better infrastructure, and that worked. Uh, what we found 10 years later, and it did take a decade, you know, it's, th these things take a lot of time and investment, but today, nine out of 10 of the largest telcos in the world run on OpenStack because of, of his vision and kind of uh, you know, calling for that unification. And in terms of the foundation's approach to this, we think that a lot of what we learned and succeeded with that transition will apply to the next era of open infrastructure for the AI era. And one of the things that we have created as a method that we think about in terms of how to build a successful uh, open source collaboration that can be global with hundreds of thousands of people participating is what we call the three forces. And so this is really about making sure that you don't just have you know, vendors in an ecosystem that dominate, but you definitely need them there. Not just developers kind of writing whatever they think the market wants. Um, and of course, you're nowhere without users slash customers. So keeping those in balance and continually growing those three groups is the key to building a, a successful platform ecosystem. So that's the same way we're approaching this kind of AI era, as well as, uh, again, the opportunity with the VMware and the digital sovereignty 
those still uh, are still in play and in, in, in the near term, probably even bigger opportunities for, for everybody. But the basic kind of um, premise here is that we start by connecting all the, the people who might not know each other yet, might not know that each other at other companies are working on similar things, try to agree on a common vision, and then really look at what software exists today in open source and what still needs to be written, and then really um, coordinate all that work upstream. So as a foundation, you know, our employees don't write all the code. We write very little of the code. We actually are coordinating the efforts of, of a much, much larger ecosystem that goes beyond just, you know, our, our employees at, at our foundation. But the system really works, and we believe that it's critical because it does unlock permissionless innovation. And this is really just about one of the many characteristics and benefits of open source. It means that anyone can contribute to the future of this technology. And I think particularly with AI, this is more important than ever. If we end up with you know, a monopoly or an oligopoly of, of open source models and, and infrastructure providers that power them, that's not gonna be a great uh, place to end up. I think that that is gonna have uh, you know, a, two, two, a short list of gatekeepers that sort of decide this fundamental technology and not enough of the voices of everyone around the world and not enough economic opportunity for everybody. So we're certainly betting on open source. It's not guaranteed to be the winning approach, but it's definitely the one we're betting on with this community and, and as a foundation. And uh, lastly, I wanna just mention some, some concrete examples <clears throat> of work that's going on in the community with OpenStack to prepare us for the AI era. So uh, if you look at the HPC market, high performance computing, for many years, OpenStack's been the dominant sort of you know, cloud operating system, if you will, for this market. A lot of that work technically ends up being very ap applicable to AI. It's accelerators, GPUs, making them available in virtualized environments, you know, behind an API, et cetera. And oftentimes, the end users are, are quite similar as well. Some of people who use HPC are actually doing AI training with it, so th there's really a lot of overlap there. And uh, to give a couple of concrete examples of real AI uh, supercomputers being built with OpenStack, the largest, fastest supercomputer in the UK, purpose-built for AI, it's called Dawn. This is running on OpenStack, and it was uh, built in partnership with one of our member companies, Stack HPC. So this is a great sign that, again, a new era of infrastructure means new opportunity for OpenStack and open source infrastructure overall. Uh, another data point I don't have on the slide, but I want to mention is that we actually, uh, one of the top 10 buyers in the world of GPUs in the past year, just buying as many as they can possibly get their hands on, is a company called NextGen Cloud that's powered by OpenStack. So it's not the case that the default path is just going to the hyperscaler clouds when it comes to GPUs and AI. People that want access to this will, will be happy to get it from anywhere they can, and that creates an opportunity for additional kind of cloud and uh, service providers, and we are excited about that. Um, lastly, OpenStack itself has had 29 on-time releases, which is kind of crazy. We just had OpenStack Caracal released a few weeks ago, and vGPU, the virtual GPU support in the Nova project has been in there for several years, but what we, we'll see if this demo will, will play, there it goes. What, what just landed in uh, the Caracal release of OpenStack is a live migration for vGPU workloads. So uh, with this unprecedented demand from, let's say, machine learning and AI researchers, or anybody who's just um, desperate to get their hands on some GPU clusters, that means there's more and more pressure to share those, build clouds, build clusters, have different departments, you know, take, take time and you use it today, I'll use it tomorrow, but it's a great use case for cloud, right? But it's uh, required some fundamental upgrades in OpenStack, and one of them is live migration for vGPUs, so always wanna include a demo. So to kind of wrap up here, um, as Jensen had recently said, a trillion dollars has already been built for accelerated compute. A whole nother trillion needs to be built. Um, Mark Zuckerberg recently said, like, we don't have a gigawatt data center yet on the planet. We need that. So we're actually needing to upgrade the whole planet in terms of electricity and just physical 
infrastructure. And along with that, of course, comes lots of new software. And our job is to make sure that it gets produced in the open with all of you so we can all participate in it. And again, we are a foundation that's backed by our members. We have over 110,000 members in 187 countries. That it represents developers, but also uh, the ecosystem and the operators. And we really feel confident that we know how to do this. We have the playbook. We did it with the 5G transition. Now that the next era of infrastructure is upon us and it's going to happen faster with more investment than ever, this is what we do. This is uh, the next time that we have a chance to really accelerate adoption of OpenStack. And we couldn't be more excited about it. So we are Open Infra Foundation, and I'm Mark Collier, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, have we got any questions for Mark? Oh. <laughs> because I have one. All oh, right. Uh, might be an unfair one, but uh, <coughs> I mean, I'm head of OSPO, so we have a lot of different uh, aspects of open source. Uh, and you said yourself that you're betting on open source, right? That, that's the kind of modus operandi that you want to kind of see and successful in the future, as well as in the past. Um, how do you interact with lawmakers and governments across, especially in Europe versus the US and with all the macroeconomical difficulties that we have? Mm -hmm. And how do you see that progressing in terms of influencing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I would say that uh, it was something I did kind of uh, skip over in this talk about what all has changed in the last few years. And without a doubt, like the regulatory environment as it relates to open source in general and also there are many, many regulations that are being proposed around AI, which kind of like potentially do some collateral damage to open source in general. So I think that they're, we're in a very different world than we were a few years ago, where at that time governments sort of, you know, maybe were fairly uh, unaware of open source or didn't, weren't thinking about it or trying to develop like real specific rules around it. Now it's open source. The good news is open source kind of took over the world. Bad news is now everybody, you know, wants to have an opinion on how to regulate it. So how do we engage with that? I mean, I think um, there's a, been a few specific uh, recent regulations like the CRA um, in which, you know, we, our team and other working in conjunction with other foundations try to kind of go and uh, educate some of the policymakers on some of the things like when they put out draft code or draft, not code, but <laughs> draft, uh, you know, legislation and for comment to say, look, some of these uh, thing, this, some of this language is really presupposes that all code comes from like one company. It's like, that's not really how open source works, especially the open source we do, which comes from hundreds of companies. And what we've seen is concrete progress there where like subsequent uh, versions of the CRA uh, were much more kind of uh, aware of uh, groups like open source foundations and the role that we play that doesn't just fit neatly into it's a for-profit that produces software because we're a nonprofit that's co coordinating. So it's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, it, we're very aware of it, and it's something that I think we feel no one foundation or group can, can uh, participate in on their own. So we have to be unified across the foundation world as well. And uh, we have some... Uh, regular meetings with folks that really care about this stuff. And it includes like a lot of OSPO. Yes, uh, that's a great answer. And I think we have also a, a responsibility as, as a OEM or as, as a part of the industry to actually influence ourselves. Uh, yes, there's a question here. Yeah. Uh-oh. So, uh, Mark, uh, on that note, we've uh, all seen that open source has kind of sort of, in a, in a sense, come under attack in, in many different ways, or at least been challenged in how we thought it was going to work 10 years ago and what it's doing today. So if you're looking at some of the things that are going on, like Terraform now and Tofu and, and some of these challenges, like how does uh, the Open Infra Foundation, um, or particularly yourself, what do you think will happen going forward there? And do you see, like, 
are we going to find a different path for open source to make sure that we can combat that, so to speak, in, in that sense and survive uh, in, a, in a kind of tough world for open source? Yeah. Well, you bring up some really good examples also that I, I probably should have should have covered earlier. But, um, you know, in the world of like what's changed, we see um, a lot of tools that people have really bet on. This goes back to that trust thing, right? Like Terraform from HashiCorp. So many people saw that as kind of like the, the universal translator layer for talking to different clouds and it was open source and everyone thought, well, of course it's open source. This is, this is the kind of tool that would naturally be open source and it, that helped it gain like huge traction in different organizations. And then HashiCorp made the decision to basically change the license and make it no longer open source. And then some, uh, a fork was stood up and then there's some like legal uh, back and forth about what, what, what's allowed. And I think that um, I, I fundamentally am an optimist about open source. And I think that there is a real issue that some companies face where their entire product line is open source and they see sort of the big hyperscale providers as a threat and they kind of want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be able to, to have this big funnel, this big adoption of open source that sort of say, but not you, Amazon. And, you know, I think personally that that approach is, is, is flawed and it isn't going to be the final answer. I don't know that we know what the final answer is going to be, but I think you saw a lot of companies mobilize developers and, and money around things like Open Tofu as an alternative to Terraform that's truly developed in the open. So, I mean, I don't have the perfect crystal ball, but I do think that uh, open source ultimately is a net massive positive, um, not just for sort of like moral reasons or, or whatever, ethical reasons, but actually just purely on an economic basis, more money is made, more economic opportunity is created when we have a truly open uh, model for, for certain layers of the stack. It's not gonna be every piece of software is gonna be open source. But I think when it comes to these platforms and these sort of infrastructure shifts, it's really, really important for it to be to be open source. And I, I'm an optimist that we're gonna we're gonna figure out like where where that settles out. But I, exactly how, you know, I can't uh, predict. All right. Cool. Thank you, Mark.